afternoon and welcome to you all. Today we have a super interesting guest. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I was 17, I was thinking about how to deal with uh, pubes and how to uh, talk to my crush. Uh, our guest was busy doing things that compiled the national security services to open a file on him. And he would not shy away from doing interesting things later in life either. After working as a war reporter for Dutch media outlets, he moved to Russia to begin a magazine after following the fall of the Iron Curtain, important to know. Um, and his independent publishing house gained huge success that in 2005, he sold it to Sonoma Media for about 150 euros. Yes, and uh, 150 million euros, yes. we need to say. Mm. And then in 2017, he bought back the Moscow Times, and he has been fighting to keep it alive till this very day. He moved uh, the Moscow Times to Amsterdam, which he wants to become the hub for free Russian independent media. And without further ado, let us uh, invite our guest today, Dirk Sauer. Welcome. Hi, hi, hi. So, thank you for, uh, for being here today. Well, yeah, uh, watch out for the couch. <laughs> I'm very small for this couch. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in preparation for this interview, we have um, uh, read a book uh, about your life, and uh, it ends, uh, uh, the foreword, it ends with the following quote, eventually, we never left Russia, signed Dirk and Ellen Sauer, uh, Sauer, April 2013. Did you expect to sit here today as a refugee? Um. Uh, obviously not, because I, would, I had never planned to leave Russia. Um, and I still miss my house uh, every day. We, our house is still there, everything. The toothbrush is still in the cup. Uh, all our books and, and our stuff is there. So, yeah, no, no, uh, of course. Now, for me, I'm born in Amsterdam and raised in Amsterdam. Mm. So... I don't call myself a refugee, of course. No. You know, I, I'm, I'm back to the city where I was born. But for my Russian colleagues, and there are now about 150 Russian uh, journalists and their families in Amsterdam, yeah. um, for them, you know, they really have left everything behind to pursue independent journalism. Yes, and... Um, in, in the book, it, it also, you know, speaks about your youth. Huh? So, so let's, be, let's begin there, maybe. You were a member of the Marxist-Leninist Center of the Netherlands, one of the predecessors. Marxist-Leninist uh, Center. Leninist Center. I would not be a good journalist at the Moscow Times. And, <laughs> and uh, what, what made you sympathize with the, the, uh, the Soviet Union at, at the time? Well, I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s. Um, and this is the last century. Um, <laughs> and uh, there was this Vietnam War going on. And, uh, you know, like many of my generation, uh, we were very, you know, against this war. Uh, we were protesting every single week mm -hmm. here in Amsterdam. And, and so that, you know, it was just part of my upbringing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to my shock and horror, I see that now young people in majority are voting for the PVV, yeah. the right-wing party in the Maybe Netherlands. Maybe is, is it also so something contrarian, because hey, your ancestral home was located on the Stalin lane? I was born on the Stalin and, line. And was later renamed to the Freedom Lane right. after the invasion of uh, Hungary in 1956. So there was not a lot of uh, sympathy for the Soviet Union, so to say, huh? in, uh, in the Netherlands. No, no, but uh, I must correct you because I was very left-wing, but ne never pro-Soviet Union. I was on the Maoist side, mm -hmm. okay. China, which, looking back, of course, is not much better. No, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> okay. maybe even worse. Yeah. Uh, but, well, you know, um, you make mistakes in your life. Um, but, yeah, I mean... Uh, we were all, you know, my generation was very left-wing. And um, even on that note, uh, your file was interesting enough for the Dutch security services to open a file you on, on the age of 17. 
Um, when you read the file today, do you recognize the guy that they're describing? Well, well, first of all, it's very strange. The the the, the Beife Day, that's the Dutch, you know, Secret Service, uh, uh, started investigating me when I was 17 because we I organized a demonstration in uh, Amstelveen. It's a suburb of Amsterdam, mm. um, and they have been following my whole life ever until the moment I left to Russia, mm -hmm. to the Soviet Union. So. Um, and I was one of thousands of young people who were militant, uh, you know, organizing meetings and so on. Mm. So why they picked me, uh, I don't know. It's it's a mystery to me. Uh, well, I was uh, maybe because you were uh, already maybe well known. Because at 16 years old, you were already presenting a youth program on the national television. So do you feel you always had a gift for media? Um, well, I always, you know, I, I, I was very privileged that from a very young age, I knew what I wanted to be. Okay. And, and that, was that was a journalist. So I, you know, I, you know, I see with so many young people, including my own kids, sort of, you know, what do I want to be? And it's a tough choice, you know, so many, uh, uh possibilities. Mm. Um, but I only wanted to one thing. And I, I, of course I was editor of the school paper, mm -hmm. uh, I was editor of the paper of my left-wing party. Uh, I, you know, then I became the editor of the of the newspaper of the Soldiers Union, mm -hmm. um, and I've been writing ever since I was like 15 or so. And you didn't just write because um, in the 1970s, when your mom turned on the radio, thinking that you were learning English in Ireland, what did she actually hear? Uh, well, she heard a young man reporting from Belfast, uh, and that Belfast, young man was you. Uh, Belfast was the, uh, the the capital of Northern Ireland, and there was a basically a civil war going on there, um, uh, an uprising from the Catholic minority against the Protestant majority, and uh, yeah, I had told my parents, you know, I'm going, uh, uh, you know, I was the big sheep in the family, all my. Mm. Brothers had done studies and my sister and so on. And I had no training whatsoever. So I told them I would go to Dublin to follow some courses at the university. Uh, but I took the train to Belfast. Mm. And uh, I started living in the house of a local IRA, the Irish Republican Army. Yeah, and you did not only report from that house, uh, but you also sat in the Volkskrant in uh, 2013. Quote, when I was 19, I went to Ireland to work for the IRA. Within no time, it turned out that they were actually just gangs fighting each other. Drug trafficking and extortion were the order of the day. I was in the middle of it. I have carried weapons for them. They were hidden under my back seat. Of course, attacks were committed with it. That's quite something if you're 19. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but well, how do you look huh. back at that? Well, well. first of all, I was 19, um, and I was living with, you know, the problem there, as I said, the, the IRA was split in several gangs, and mm. they were all fighting each other. Uh, they were fighting against the British Army, but they were also fighting against themselves. So these people, um, that I, the family that I lived with, and were very nice people, who were actually... On, on the most pacifist side of the IRA, um, they the, the, tried. The, the, that does exist. The yeah, pacifist yeah. side of the IRA. Absolutely. Okay. The, the, you know, there was a, a radical wing and a more moderate wing. Yeah. And they were on the moderate wing, and uh, and they had to defend themselves against attacks in their neighborhood. Mm. Um, but, so, but because it says attacks were committed with it. No, that, no, that that's not correct. They it's your own quote. Well, no, no, no. They were defending themselves. Okay. Okay. So, but still, you know, uh, I, I definitely would not do that today. Um, but in that situation, I mean, it was bombs went off, shootings every day. It was a madhouse. Hmm. Um, uh, after the Berlin Wall uh, uh, fell, a prominent uh, Dutch publishing house started a joint venture in Russia, uh, VNU. 
And while discussing who to appoint as uh, editor in chief uh, for this new venture, a board member said, uh, That sour guy, uh, he's a communist, right? Uh, why don't we send him? Uh, and they decided uh, to ask you, Do you remember the moment you got the call? Yeah, sure, because <coughs> I was editor in chief of a magazine called Nieuwe Revue, and all the people in the audience will remember this magazine. Uh, it still exists, but it's very small now, but in those days it was really big. Um, and uh, I was sitting at my desk as, as the editor, and some Russians came into the building. Uh, they were from the Soyuz Journalist of the Union of Journalists of, of Moscow. Um, and they came up with this idea to start a joint venture. And then my boss called me and said, these Russians are here, you know, you know, you know communists, you know, so you mm -hmm. talk to them. But at the age of 29, during that time, you owned a house on PC Hofstraat, had a lovely life in Amsterdam, were an editor of chief, as you mentioned, but then you still decided to take a position in Russia. Did you have a midlife crisis? Was life getting too comfortable? Yeah. Yeah, you could say exactly that. Um, I have been an editor for <coughs> like eight or nine years. Mm. I had a very good life. Uh, we had a w wonderful house. We just had a ba our first baby. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it was too comfortable for me. I, 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 needed, I wanted to have a little bit more excitement. Mm -hmm. As you said, I've been a war correspondent for many, many years, traveling all over the world. Um, and Moscow seemed a very good uh, solution because mm -hmm. my wife didn't want me to go to wars, which yeah. I fully understand because you know we had a child and we had a family, uh, and m there was no war in Moscow at that time. Um, uh, and but the history was happening; the wall was just coming down, and things uh, were changing. Things were changing, and this was, you know, it seems like a journalist dream. Mm -hmm. And what did your uh, close friends and family at that time think when you said, I'm going to Russia? Well, people, of course, were very worried because, you know, you s on the TV you saw all the empty shops and all the lines and there was no food. And, mm. and I must say, the f you know, our first two years were really difficult. We had a seven months old baby mm -hmm. uh, there were no diapers you know just no milk uh, you know you had to stand in line uh, at one in the morning to get bread so did you sort of start over your life again yeah it was like it was like camping out you know <laughs> we had a very small we came from this beautiful house in the PC Hofstraat uh, to a very small apartment full of cockroaches um, uh, and, and then to top it off, huh, you, you meet your new colleagues what? and you ask them, huh, what, what did you do before this? And could you name their former employer for, uh, for us? Well, of course, they, they came to us as being of this union of journalists. But you know, I was totally naive you know, uh, mm -hmm. at that time. But may, may, maybe because I know the answer, but what, yeah. to, the, to the audience? Well, they were all KGB agents. So, uh, okay. uh, yeah. So and KGB I, 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 uh, is the intelligence service of yeah uh, the secret service of, of the Russia. first employer what? Putin had what? in his what? life yeah yeah, yeah 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 okay and those were the people you needed to start journalism with yes and of course um, see what is very interesting about those first years uh, when I came there it was completely dark eh? there was no light there was no there were no shops. Uh, but still life went on and people were very excited about the changes. Mm. And they had this naive idea that if capitalism com came, mm -hmm. they would automatically get rich. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you first have to work to get rich, they didn't get, you know? So, mm -hmm. so they just came to the office at 11 in the morning uh, and then we had a meeting, and then they went to the restaurant to drink a lot of vodka. Mm -hmm. uh, and at four o'clock, half drunk, they came back to the office, and that was their day. And in addition to that, like 
you describe this kind of day, and they're also from the book that we read, uh, they also said that they oftentimes wanted you to offer jobs to their family and friends. So how did you deal with that side of business? So, well, I decided basically to let these people sit in their office mm. and get drunk every day. Um, there's a saying in Russia in those days, we pretend to work, Mm -hmm. and you pretend to pay us. <laughs> that was sort of the general mood of the Soviet Union. And in our case, they get, because it was a joint venture with a Dutch company, so they, get, they got paid in, Euro, in, in guilders. It mm -hmm. was still at those Gilders, times. Yes, yes. That was before the euro. And it was more worth, eh? hard and, currency. And it was, it was hard currency. So they had wonderful lives, you mm -hmm. know, these guys. So I decided to let them sit in that office and I went, uh, uh, you know, basically th through uh, context I, I developed, I found young people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. students, uh, people with no education in journalism whatsoever, but really eager people. Mm -hmm. And I trained them, and they made the magazine. Mm -hmm. But you, you also developed a tactic, it says. Derek developed a winning tactic, smile, keep everyone happy, and then do exactly as he wanted. Well, that's what I did. So, uh, you know, I, I was always very nice to these people of the, of the union. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, I had my own team. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did the real work. Yeah. So the union did not do... So they did. didn't do anything. <laughs> no. They just got drunk. No, and it was even worse, we read, because it was super hard to get things done. Huh? You, for example, moved offices, you rented space from the Ministry of Defense, right. and then you wanted a few extra telephone lines huh, to do your work as journalists. Um, who, who declined that request? Uh, well, uh, The same Ministry of Defense. The, exactly. How do you solve that? I bought a video recorder. Mm -hmm. And then, what and I went with? into the office. I said, "Here's a video recorder. Who wants a video recorder?" And it was expensive at the time, correct? And that was very expensive. Uh, that was uh, for you know, that was like something really special. Mm. And I said, "If I get a phone, you get the video. Re the one, the person that gets me the phone line gets the video recorder." And the whole office st stood up. <laughs> and you had a phone line in there. And time. I had a phone line. But um, you, obviously, we, we can see you also start adapting and finding your way in a new society, starting fresh. But we were also wondering, was there a line that you drew between what you were willing to do and what would be going too far? No, that's very simple. Uh, journalism. So uh, in all these years, and I've worked in, in Russia for 32 years, and I built a very big company, mm. and after that ran another very big media house, um, I had one very strong principle, and that my journalists should be free to write whatever they felt was necessary. So a total freedom for my team, and, and it later it became my teams, uh, to write good journalism. And to what extent would you go to defend that interest, for example, in Russia? Well, uh, to, uh, to very extreme, because we were attacked throughout the years, nonstop by the government, by oligarchs, mm -hmm. by mafia. But the, 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 the thing is, of course, hey, you are being judged all these years by the Dutch press as well. Huh? And they have, I've read it all, they have always been looking for you know a get uh, gotcha moment, right, hey, right. They, they would say hey, that that sour is bribing people or right. doing dirty deals, and then we read this, hey, and this is I mean I would say not the biggest offense in the history of humankind, but you know if you start with a video recorder, you know a house might be next, and then hey, uh, so how do you get yourself to not go on a slippery slope in in order to defend your own interests? Well, that's what I just explained because uh, I mean. Uh, to uh, to live in, a, in in Russia certainly certainly in the early 90s mm. when there was nothing available but also when there were no rules because the Soviet laws did not exist anymore but there were no new laws there were all, there was only one law and that was the law of the street mm -hmm. in those days so you know 
I'll give you a very practical example. We, we lived in a house outside mm. Moscow. We moved from a tiny apartment to a house outside Moscow. Um, and the owner before us had illegally tapped the electricity, which was everyone was doing that. Mm. So, you know, the, but we wanted to pay electricity. So I went to the electricity company. I said, I'd like to pay you. And they said, which address? Zhukovka uh, 186. And then they said, yeah, but uh, uh, people have been stealing there for the last so many years, you know? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, I know. That's why I don't want to steal. I want to pay you. And then they said, well, you've, before you can pay us, you have to pay us the bill of that old owner, yeah. which was a huge sum. But not officially. That was a bribe I have to give to this guy. Yeah. So what do you do in a situation like that? You want to be an honest citizen, so you have to bribe someone to become an honest citizen. So that shows you the environment you had to deal with. We had to deal with. And after two years um, living there, you decided to start your own paper, the Moscow Times, which is still running today. Um, and you did it also separate from the publishing house you worked for before. Who was your target audience at that time when you were thinking of this? Uh, the Moscow Times was the very first English language daily, mm -hmm. uh, a newspaper in print in the history of the Soviet Union and, and Russia. Um, so, you know, what I noticed is there were more and more Westerners coming to, to Russia. You know, it was, for a while it was very fashionable to go to Moscow. So, you know, companies opened offices, uh, the big L'Oreal, Shell, all the car brands, everyone came to Russia because it was like, uh, you know, uh, Bonanza. A bonanza. It was an, uh, a new market. Um, and these, most of these people, of course, did not read or speak Russian. Neither did I. Yeah, but in the end of the book, it says that you still struggle with it. Is it true? Yeah, my, my, my Russian is very so-so. I understand everything, but speak... 32 years. Yeah, but I've been very busy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, my, that's my excuse. And I have three sons who are fluent in Russian. Hmm. I have my wife, Ellen, who's fluent in Russian. So they do uh, the talking, you do the... So I yeah. can always ask uh, if I don't, don't get it. We read that your first editor at the Moscow Times was called Meg Bortin. What? And um, I'm sorry to say, but it says on page 110 that uh, she was super demanding and she raised the bar for all those young journalists and a lot of them had to cry and they called it uh, in Dutch is it's schrikbewind wow. and that translates to reign of terror could you have done that in the same way today with the current uh, no not at all should you have done things differently you always, uh, if you look back on your life, you know, I'm an old man, so uh, of course some things you wanted to do differently. But on the other hand, I'm Meg Borden was a very famous American journalist. Mm -hmm. And she came to Russia. We had, I had assembled this. I mean, these were all your age, basically, you know, in, uh, you know, in their 20s, you know. Yeah, um, so... For so, normal people. And it was a daily newspaper. So every day we had to perform. Yeah. And we were already then a very influential newspaper. Yeah, but, we, but, but let, let, let me get back to my question real quick. Because we now have hey, the real dry door. You were a frequent guest there. Uh, they, they have had their own reckoning hey, with what? the way things, the sausage was made, so to say. And uh, I think you also must have reflected on how you ran your editorial floor, so to say. Yeah, no, no. I mean, uh, uh, and at a certain point, I fired Meg Borton. For this reason? For this reason. So and the answer is, yes, I should have done it differently. What? Sorry? When did you fire her? About two years. In? So after two years? Yeah. <laughs> good, uh, yeah. good answer. Mm -hmm. so something else uh, also changed eh, uh, during that time, because... Uh, after the coup in 1991, you lost your appreciation for communism or for 
Maoism, uh, whatever you like, because, quote, it's easy to say that the theories of Marx and Lenin are okay, but Stalin and his successors raped them, page 88. What, uh, what uh, did you see that made you change your mind? Well, you know, in Russia, the kitchen is the, the center of life. Uh, so if you are a guest with people, you go to the kitchen and they put food on the table and vodka and so on. And certainly in those early days, they all started to talk about the gulags, the camps. Mm, mm. They all had a, a, a grandfather, grandmother, uncle, nephew, someone in the family who had gone to the camps and never returned. So to be confronted day in, day out with these stories, of course you realize the horrors of, of communism. Mm -hmm. um, and what started like a good idea um, very often turns into a, an awful thing. And that's what we see again today, of course, with the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, the theories of, you know, of Marx, if you read Marx today, it's still very actual and interesting to read. But it has only translated in horror. And in that reality. is very sad. In reality. In reality, yes. So have you, you've changed your mind since then? Well, I'm still very left wing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and what, I think the. What did you vote last election? Because you're the most prominent member of uh, SP, uh, apart from Jan Marijnissen, I think. Uh, what, what, did you vote SP? No, I this was the first time in my life yeah. that I did not vote SP. Okay. But I voted for the progressive uh, GroenLinks Partij van de Arbeid. It was a strategic vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, and <laughs> it didn't help a lot. No, no, <laughs> not one bit, no. But um, just to wrap this up before we move to audience questions, you were a communist, so to say, in a capitalist country and then more of a capitalist in a communist country. Do you like to be a contrarian? No, I don't think so. I don't think that uh, uh, I'm per se against or for something. Um, what I like to do is, you know, build a company that in itself is a little bit socialist. Mm -hmm. So the companies that I, 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 I built uh, uh, and worked with, uh, we try to uh, create our own um, socialist idea of sharing, responsibility, all these things, mm -hmm. uh, um, sustainability, well, <laughs> you name it. Um, and in in Holland, that was with Nieuwe Revue and, and other projects I did. Uh, and in Russia, it's with, with independent media. But, uh, but uh, of course, the circumstances were completely different, but the values were the same. What I can say about my life is that I started out as an, a, 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 a revolutionary with a pen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that's how I, I, I thought about myself when I was like 20 years old. Um, and now I'm really a, a journalist. I, I think the biggest uh, 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 contribution I can have to society is to fight for solid, uh, uh, honest, independent journalism. And on that note, we'll open the floor to some audience questions. Are there currently any in the floor? Yes. We'll move to the here, the front row. There the microphone comes. Um, she will hold the microphone. We always have audience members who uh, try to yank it. Um, here in the yeah, second row. Yeah. Your name and then uh, your question. Ilya Freudenthal here. Um, I'm going to go a little bit back in history to about 1995-1996. So what was the policy of the Moscow Times during the 96 presidential election? Um, I tried to go to the archives and to see if you guys wrote anything about the like smear campaign of Zyuganov, um, Galasuili Preigrash, Choose or Lose, um, and also a bit of a like a hermeneutic kind of like um, like inquiry like how do you feel now in light of the war in Ukraine 
um, when Boris Nemtsov has been killed um, and when Putin was selected instead of Nemtsov. So what do you think about it now, looking back? Um, should you have written more? Should you have written about it differently? What do you think? Uh, well, for the people in the audience who are not so familiar with uh, the ins and outs of Russian politics, because the question is, is relevant to that. <coughs> Basically, uh, um, uh, uh, Yeltsin eh, was re-elected um, after the, the, the voting was basically rigged by the liberals. Um, and uh, that was the beginning of the end, basically, because we had a, uh, uh, for the first time, Russia had a constitution, Russia had a more or less free election, and in that free election, basically the Communist Party uh, probably would have won if they had counted the votes honestly. Um, but the, the, the Moscow intelligentsia and, uh, were so nervous that communism would go back that they rigged the votes. And also the media were uh, you know, manipulating and so on. So it's interesting you asked the question. The Moscow Times was the only newspaper at that time in Russia that did a very comprehensive research of the ballot stuffing. So we researched about, I don't know, a few hundred polling stations, uh, how that, you know, what, what the result should have been. Hmm. So we were the first, actually the only newspaper in Russia that wrote that actually Zhuganov probably should have won these elections. Uh, and we already said at that time that this was a very big stain on democracy. Now Russia was free for the first time, and at the first free elections, things go wrong, are man manipulated again. And that's a, 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 a history that we are still suffering from, that the, not, the, not the communists uh, or the right wing, but that the liberals were the ones to uh, 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 manipulate the elections. So uh, we, we, we wrote an awful lot about that. And uh, you asked about Nemtsov. Nemtsov was uh, one of the most important liberal uh, uh, opposition figures who was murdered in Moscow. I knew him very well. I've traveled with him. Uh, I've been in Nizhny Novgorod where he was a governor. I've been at his house and so on. Um, and of course, his murder was, uh, you know, a, a wake-up sure. call for for everyone. That you know, with Putin, uh, uh, he meant business. You know, everyone who was a real danger to his his uh, position, uh, you know, was in danger and would be murdered. And that's what we see up today in the Moscow Times. You can, you know, go to the archives; they are all free. We have the biggest archive of all newspapers uh, made available for the public. Okay. Uh, so you can all read it in the Moscow Times. Great paper. Next question. Yes, you? Yeah, hi, Mr. Sauer. Earlier on, uh, you mentioned that there was an environment of a lot of bribery in Russia and how you described the electricity company. Uh, were was the Moscow Times ever approached, or did your journalists ever use bribery to get their foot into the door for a story, for example? Yeah, so we had a very simple answer, no. We had a very golden rule, we never pay for information. Point, zero. Um, so, of course, you know, in all the hundreds of thousands of stories that we, my publications have published over the years, uh, I, I, I haven't followed everyone, but I have no indication whatsoever that any of our journalists have ever uh, done this. Um, oh, we have been approached uh, many times. You know, the, the Moscow Times is one, but even more relevant is I started a, a, the most important business newspaper yes. in Russia called Vedemosti, 
It was a joint venture with the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal and us. Um, and I remember the very first day that the newspaper came out, it was a huge thing in Russia at the time, that one of the top oligarchs called me and said, Derek, you know, I want to buy an article in your newspaper. <laughs> and I said, sorry, but... So we had billboards in the campaign to introduce this newspaper. And it was a huge billboards along all the streets in Moscow saying, you can buy this newspaper only in the kiosk. So that sent immediately the message that we you know, weren't corrupt like all the other newspapers. So I said to the guy, haven't you seen the, the billboards? You, know, <laughs> you can buy the newspaper in the kiosk, but you cannot buy articles. And he said, yeah, I know, I know, but it's all nonsense. Of course you can, we can buy articles. So he was very upset. And bringing it back, uh, you may have some time later to ask some more questions. Great question. Um, but at Independent Media, as your publication was called at the time, things were going very well. You also launched a series of other publications like Cosmopolitan, Playboy, Glamour. You brought that to Russia. Um, and we were curious. Why? Was it for the business it generated, the adventure, or the cultural change that you would introduce? You mean the glossies? Yes, the other... Um, Cosmopolitan. Yes. Um, well, to be very honest, it was because we were going bankrupt. So the Moscow Times was a great success, but it didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. um, I had sold my house in the Pese Hofstraat, uh, all our savings... Hmm. Uh, I had borrowed money from some friends. Bout Van Pullman from the lo from lottery. The, yeah, from the postcode lottery. And, um, but we still were losing money. And it was sort of, we, we didn't know what to do. And then my wife, mm -hmm. Ellen, and my co-director, Anna Marie, said, let's start a, a women's magazine. Well, you know, what did I know about women's magazines? So... But did I have any arguments against it? I mean, we were about to lose everything we had. Um, so the only good thing was that they wanted to start a magazine called L, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of prestigious and French. And I said, no, if we do a magazine, then let's do Cosmopolitan, because that's sort of the, the biggest mm. in the market. Um, so my wife and, and Anna Marie, you know, arranged the license for this title, and that, you know, that saved us. Mm -hmm. You know, the first issue was forty thousand copies. It was sold in like one day, mm -hmm. um, and one and a half years later, we had one million circulation. We were the biggest magazine in Europe, and. Uh, that didn't went unnoticed, so to say, because uh, the mafia was up and coming in those days in Russia, and they found out that a uh, quick way to make money was to extort the new rich, so right. to say. And, well, y your uh, magazine was in every stand, so they also knocked on your uh, door, and they said, you need protection right. from us. Right. What did you say? Um, I said, thank you. Um, but I learned one thing in Russia. Uh, a lot of people, uh, because it was very dangerous. Mm. I mean, murders on the street, day and night. Uh, as, also in the neighborhood where we lived. And it, it went like this. The, a guy would call you. and say, hi, Mr. Sauer, how are you? Um, I'm such and so. I'm Igor, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I want to help you. Mm. And by the way, I know you have three children, they go to this school, that you take the road, this road every day at nine o'clock. Uh, no, and then you knew, of course, it was the mafia. Um, and I always learned, don't be afraid, talk to them. Because in the Volkskrant interview I mentioned before, you said that's the way to show them, I have no fear for you. I have no fear. Fuck you with your threats. Right. So, and a lot of uh, 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 people 
got very nervous, a lot of foreigners, mm. um, and, um, and they would pay. But then once you start paying, it's the beginning of the end. Mm-hmm. Because, because I found this episode especially interesting because everywhere you read about you that uh, you don't seem to feel fear. Huh? So when the pressure gets high, people start crying and you, you know, get a napkin and you, you carry on. Um, and I thought, was this maybe also because of, you know, experiences like this that you thought, this is my defense mechanism. Yeah, when I get ch- uh, ch- uh, yeah, challenged, so you, uh, don't show fear. Yeah, th- go on the attack. Um, and then they respect you. I've learned that in Russia, you know. They, they, they respect you if they see that you're not afraid of them. Yeah. You know? And then they think, okay, well, this guy you know, clearly, you know, yeah. will find someone else. We find some coward who will give us money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they move on to the next. And you also did something else. Eh? You got very rich people to pay for your protection, basically. Well, I, I Which, if I say it like this, it, it sounds like a scheme we all would like to want. Eh? <laughs> uh, but c- c- could you briefly explain what you did? Well, th- you know, that was the time that the oligarchs were up and coming. And there was uh, one guy <coughs> that I was very intrigued by. He was a young, he, his name is Khodorkovsky. He's now the biggest enemy of Putin. In prison, huh? He has been in prison for 12 years in in Gulag, in Mm -hmm. Siberia. Um, And he's very famous. He built an oil company in Russia. Yukos. Yukos. um, uh, But he was a very intelligent, very quiet man. He was not like big yachts and like the oligarch, as you you read about in the newspaper. and uh, I went to him and, uh, to, you know, to get to know the guy. I was just curious. Uh, and then he, uh, you know, he knew the newspaper and I said, can I help you? I said, yeah, you can help me. Uh, if you buy 10% of our shares and promise not to interfere whatsoever in what we write, uh, uh, then you can help me. And you pay good money for the 10%. Uh, which this is exactly what he did. And when, uh, you know, mafia types, bandits called me, uh, I would say, you know, call Khodorkovsky. Mm-hmm. And by that time, he had a whole army, this mm-hmm. Khodorkovsky guy. So they didn't dare. To so they, they immediately, you know. Backed off. Backed off. Um, and going back to a bit of what was mentioned previously, you mentioned uh, as well that, The Moscow Times was critical at times, and in fact, focusing on that work, uh, in October 2000, the Moscow Times published a big file on the 1.3 million fabricated votes in the Russian elections, which resulted Putin to win. Um, And however, despite this, um, your book suggests that the Russian public seemed to be indifferent, that they didn't care, even though you wrote such a big exposing article. So how did that make you feel about your mission on independent media? Well, I mean, that's, that's been one of the tough issues uh, uh, working in Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, that we've published hundreds and hundreds of investigative stories over the years, not just with Moscow Times, but with Vedemisty, uh, Ebeka, where I would later work. Um, and uh, of course, they got publicity and so on, but nothing changed. Because people said, yes, we know. It's corrupt. You know, people sort of uh, living in Russia, you take it for granted. Mm -hmm. You think it's normal. It's, it's, It's actually the way it should be. And why do you think that is the case? Because you've lived there. Is it because it's comfortable this way or it's been so long that... It's, it's been part of life. I mean, under the Tsars, you know, read the, the old classics, read, read uh, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and so on, and you'll read about corruption. It's been part of the DNA of the Russian society for centuries and centuries. And can that be changed? <sighs> of course. I, <laughs> Big you know, sigh. Big sigh. I've been, you know, certainly in the 90s when everyone was so excited about the new Russia mm-hmm. and the, the changes opening and opening up. Um, uh, uh, we were all very optimistic. Uh, but, but things o- didn't change. But of course, in the end, it's, w- it's much worse now mm-hmm. 
than it was at the end of the Soviet Union. Corruption is now, say, you had the mafia and you had the state. Now, the state is the mafia. Mm -hmm. So there's no shooting on the street anymore, it's, but it's organized by the state. The state decides who runs which company, who owns what. Um, and the state is Putin and his friends. They have privatized crime, crime and, and the state. So it's their private property. And looking back at that time, after you published this piece, did you face any threats from the government? Well, we got the, you know, over the years, and also in that case, we, we got the occasional threats and phone calls. And, 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 uh, but again, there, you know, I, you know, I've been called by the Kremlin hundreds of times. They have a special department in the Kremlin. The head of that department is a guy called Gromov, who, by the way, is our was our neighbor. We also talk about this in a moment. For many years. Um, and they will say, oh, if you continue like that, it will end badly for you and so on. And if you do, you know, I've always said, well, you know, sorry, but this is the way we work. But um, I guess what many people also have for the Moscow Times is that in the Kremlin, you have various different outlets that have been pressured to be pro-Kremlin, pressured to have one narrative. How did the Moscow Times then keep its editorial independence? By just keeping it. By just not, and not caring. Not giving in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the <clears throat> for what you have to understand that in, this, in an oppressive society, especially for Russian people, uh, you have to be very brave to withstand that pressure. Um, because these people have good jobs, good lives, good money, houses, mortgages, mm. you name it. And if then people say, you know, we're going to take your company or bankrupt or arrest you or whatever threats, it's very, you have to be very, very strong um, not to give in. I was in a more privileged position because I'm a foreigner, um, and the likelihood that they will put me in jail, now I would be put in jail in five minutes, mm -hmm. because now I'm a foreign agent, I run uh, companies that are undesirable, you know, so mm. now it's different. But in those days, the likelihood that they would, they would maybe throw me out of the country, mm -hmm. but they, the likelihood they would put me in jail was very small. Yeah. And, and I, I was wondering, how, this um, time you were tolerated by Putin you know, and uh, you didn't reach the masses. You, you reached uh, the uh, educated Russians and the English-speaking Russians. Weren't you, in some sense, co-opted? Yeah, to a, certain, uh, <coughs> to a certain degree, sure. But if... if foreign delegations would come to Moscow and start complaining about press freedom. Yeah. They would say, oh, have you read the Moscow Times this morning? Yeah, you, you, know? you, you told this story before, but you seem proud of it. Hey, you say, I was on the table of Putin. But well, I mean, I'm proud of it. I'm, uh, I'm just saying what happened. You know, mm -hmm. It's just a, a, a factual... Um, but how did it make you feel that Putin felt comfortable having your paper on the table when a foreign head of state came in? Well, because, uh, you know, he knew that he could use this yeah. to say all the criticism about, you know, press freedom is unjustified, read that column or this or that. Yeah. Um, but you, 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 because the... But that's what's not, you know, uh, that's not a reason to stop publishing the Moscow Times, you know. No. The Moscow Times, uh, uh, but, uh, but I don't the, know if there the, are any Russians here in the audience, but a, a whole generation of young Russians in Moscow has grown up learning English mm. with the Moscow Times. But At the, 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 jur the journalist in me would scream from the inside, I want to make Putin feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't want to be on that table, I want to be in his head. Uh, well, you know, uh, that's, not my, my, that's, not my, that's not up to me, you know. It's uh, your paper. No, no, I'm a journalist, I have to make a good product. Um, and if someone 
like you know, for uh, they they uh, if they want to use it for their own purpose, you know, that's up to them. But what is much more important is that we told the real story to our audiences, both Russian and English. Um, and now, for instance, we have a Russian surface of the Moscow Times, Russian, because since the war we published both in Russian language and English language, and our Russian surface is you know, growing extremely fast and is one of the most influential tools of information now for independent Russians. Yeah, so you are okay with huh, servicing that audience and leaving the message for uh, the TV stations, for example. Say it again. So you, uh, you, you are okay with huh, being influential with the Engli English speaking, uh, the young people, the, uh, the, the foreigners, and, and leaving the masses then, to so to say, to the... No, no, uh, no not at all, because you know, with Vedemosti, we had you know, the most important, actually the most important newspaper, Russian language newspaper in the country. Uh, you know, Vedemosti was, uh, it's like what NSA Handelsblatt is here in the Netherlands. So we had a very influential newspaper. But that's been paused, right? Sorry? That, the, that's been paused, Vedemosti. Uh, yeah, well, that was, the, everything is take, everything I built mm. has been taken over by the Kremlin. So Vedemosti has been taken over by the Kremlin. Uh, Abaka, that's a, a big company I ran uh, after, after them, that, yeah. has been taken over by the Kremlin. Cosmopolitan, all the magazines have been you know, uh, closed down or... So they don't. I've, I've, I've built this huge company and nothing is left of it except for the Moscow Times. Um, and just bringing it back as well, 11 years ago you were at our stage here at Room for Discussions and you said if you are 20 and living in a big city like Moscow, the sky's the limit. Is that still the case today? You know, uh, uh, of, of course not, you know. Uh, on the other hand, what is so strange about this war, if I talk to my friends in Moscow who are still there, they live great lives. Even today? Today. I was talking, like, you know, the other day with... Uh, with my, my sales director, who has worked for Cosmopolitan and then for, for Ebaka, this, this other big media company I, I helped to build. Um, and she said, we had the best year ever. Was it Lena? Uh, no, it was Luda. Luda. Um, um, she, she said, we had the best year ever. And I was, what? There's a war going on. The, we have uh, sanctions. Uh, sanctions. And she says, you know, the Chinese are advertising like crazy with us. Um, the state, uh, the government is putting a lot of uh, advertising money. Um, they are organizing uh, events. They have a huge Christmas party. Uh, I said, Luda, but there's a, a war going on. Mm. See, well, well, yeah, I know there are, there are problems. If we talk over the phone with Moscow, with my, you know, most of my friends or former colleagues, they don't dare to use the word war mm. yeah, because it's forbidden. So they say there are problems. So, yes, we know there are problems. But it's like it's problems not 600 kilometers from, from their house, but it's like on another planet. Hmm. Because in Moscow, you don't notice this. In Moscow, the restaurants are full, uh, bars are full, uh, life is going on, I would say, almost even better than before the war. Um, because everything is subsidized and keeping because alive. Because this war economy is pumping up, you know. There's a huge lack of labor. Hmm. You, you know, if, if any of you would go there... <laughs> to Moscow, you have a job tomorrow. If you, uh, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of yeah. IT people have left the country. So there's a huge demand for skilled labor. Yeah, and uh, you, hey, you, you seem to have come to this realization hey, then, then that uh, things are still going, still, still riding. And you've also written that 
um, reflecting on, on your own role in you know, the lead up to the invasion. Uh, February 2020, you wrote, or the, the title of your column was, I am ashamed not to have warned enough for the tyrant of these times. That's quite a title. Yeah, that was the first column I wrote after the invasion. Mm. Because I remember the day before the invasion, I had dinner with Russian friends. And we were, of course, talking about you know, uh, what's going on and the buildup of troops and everything. We were about 12 people in the room. Every single one of those 12 people were convinced there would never be a war. Every, every single one. What about you? Including myself. I mean, we were toasting, like, you know, on, on, on peace, mm. you know? Um, and then the next night, the war started. So, and then your, your son, uh, Piotr, called, huh? Yeah, my son called in the in the middle of the night, you know, because he was the one who said he predicted that the war mm. would come, and I always said, Piotr, no, 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 no." And why did you underestimate? Why did you think it was not going to happen? Because we all had this feeling that we knew Putin was a very nasty man. Mm -hmm. You know, we I've been writing for, I, you know, I, I went back to my own columns. I write a column for th over 30 years now, every week for the Amsterdam newspaper, Het Parole. So I went back to my old colleagues, and I already in the, f in the week that he became the first president, so this is 2000, I wrote, he is a dangerous person. So it's not that we didn't know, we knew he was a dangerous person, mm -hmm. and I've been writing that for over 20 years. Um, but we always thought, I always thought, there was some rationality behind it. And this war is against any form of rationality. So that's why, you know, we couldn't just, it, it was beyond our frame of thinking mm. that this could happen. Um, and that it has been a fatal mistake. Um. And in addition to that, you also have written and you have just said that um, now you find that people who used to be your neighbors and friends, you're on different sides of the battle with. For example, um, Gromov, uh, the deputy chief of staff in the Kremlin, in the 1990s he was your neighbor and your children were friends, they went to school together and you'd visit one another. However, now he is responsible for press censorship in Russia. And his son, Losha, who was your son's classmate before, is the boss of the propaganda channel RT in Moscow. How has this perception changed the people who you thought you once knew? Well, of course, this is... Um, uh, uh, it's very tough to see people that you've known very well and you thought were more or less reasonable, even if you didn't agree on everything, but at least were more or less reasonable people becoming basically murderers, you know, responsible for the death of hundreds of thousands of people. You know, that, you know, that, that is for Gromov and, and Peskov and other people in the presidential administration that I knew quite well. But also just personal, on the personal friends, eh, because these were acquaintances, not personal friends, but people who were very close to us who are still in Moscow, they are not supporting the war, but they don't condemn it. They close their eyes. Uh, they say, yes, of course, it's terrible, but it's the but. but. So you still speak to them? Oh, yeah, of course, that's my job. Yeah, you know, we, the, the telephone line to Russia still... Uh, WhatsApp, Earth. Signal, uh, sure, sure. But are you able to openly say everything? I say everything. Mm. They say everything in hushed terms, like mm. the problems, uh, unfortunate, yes, but NATO is also wrong, 
Yes, but Zelensky doesn't want peace. So they, and what you have to, I mean, put yourself in their shoes. Um, they are now part of a society that is killing hundreds of thousands of people, both Russians and Ukrainians. And it's very hard to justify that for yourself mm -hmm. if you still live there and, and, and go to restaurants and go out and so on. So it does something with your mind. So people that I've known as very nice, warm, friendly people come up with all these excuses now for themselves. And let's not forget, you know, there are not, you know, many of you are not from Holland, but Dutch people in the Second World War also went on with their lives. Yeah, we're complacent. Uh, the resistance was only a handful of people. Mm. You know, we're now talking always here in Holland about the resistance, yeah. but 99% of the Dutch people just continued with, with their lives and with their work and with going to the concert theater, despite the fact that all Jewish artists were mm. uh, uh, thrown out, you know? So it's, a, it's also a human reaction and I'm not condoning it. I'm not supporting it at all. I condemn it, mm. but it's a human condition um, that, you know, you get up in the morning and try to make the best of the day. Yeah, yeah. and you try to do that. I yeah, I also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah, but but but, uh, uh, but uh, you also have to. How do you say that? Uh, deal with a lot of loss. Uh, they have to deal with the fact that they are still there, and you have to deal with losing everything, so to say. Because there, 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 there's one episode. It is not the question on here, but uh, uh, there was one episode in the book. I was uh, I am reminded of by this, because uh, you never seem to have. Even if your back is against the wall, you don't back down. You uh, you go sit in the casino with the mafia boss and you say, yeah, uh, sue me, no problem. But then Lena, so uh, one of your first employees, she wants to leave. And she sits down and she says, I have this other offer. I am about to depart. And then for the first time, I have the feeling that you say uh, wh whatever you want, but please stay. You can have your own magazine. It cost a lot of money. When it was a complete flop, I believe. Was that one of the few moments, maybe, where you you yeah you felt you had to give in to yeah, still have what you had at the moment? Um, well, this was this was the first person I met in Russia was a translator, a Dutch Russian translator. Russian Dutch, she was Russian, she spoke Dutch. She had never been in Holland, by the way, but she spoke fluent Dutch. Um, and she stayed with us until the very end. Uh, and from being a translator, she became the CEO of the whole company. Uh, and at a certain point, uh, she had a very good offer to become editor-in-chief of Vogue magazine. The with big competitor. A big competitor. Um, and that crushed me, indeed, because we, you know, we met when she was a student uh, uh, at, at, uh, at university and was my first translator. Um, and then we went through everything. So, yeah, yeah, th then I gave in, yeah. Um, but in the end, uh, uh, um, it didn't make her happy, it didn't make me happy. No, so you learned also from that then. And bringing it back to the Moscow Times today, we're talking about a lot of aspects of the war ongoing. But one thing that I had in mind was why, and I found it particularly interesting, you relocated uh, in the beginning of the Russian full-scale invasion in 2022. But what about periods of conflict in 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia or in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea? You didn't have thoughts of leaving back then? No, 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 not at all. <clears throat> and listen, we would not have left even now. Mm -hmm. I wanted to stay. Um, I very much wanted to stay because <clears throat> a, a journalist should be where the conflict is. Mm -hmm. And it's it's you know it's it's really bad that we are sitting here and not in Moscow. Um, but the reality was that Putin introduced this law 
which was the fastest law ever, uh, ever adopted by the Russian parliament, uh, within a week, this new law that everyone who spoke out about the war and used the word war could get 15 years of prison. And still, I did not want to leave. But for my co Russian colleagues, the, you know, I was responsible for my Russian colleagues, the risk uh, to keep writing about the war as we did, because it was war, you know, <laughs> every other word in, the, in, the, in our newspaper was about the war. The risk for them was too high. Mm -hmm. And that's why we decided to uh, uh, leave the country. But you still have some uh, journalists in Russia today. Yeah, we still have about 20 people in Russia. And how are they reporting? I know you removed the bylines, so it's now just the Moscow Time that publishes these articles. Right. But how can you protect their safety? Well, we can't. Um, so they're all underground. They're, of course, not... Our office is standing empty. Um, uh, uh, so they operate under the radar. Um, communication is very difficult, um, but they do file stories, um, and uh, and they know that they run a big risk. Mm -hmm. They know, especially now, you know, last week, um, two weeks ago, the you know, we were already a foreign agent, mm -hmm. uh, but last week the Moscow Times, and specifically myself, also was. Again, named a foreign agent in yeah. Moscow Times, Russian and English. Um, so yes, they're running more and more yes. risks, but they find it extremely important to continue with their work because it's the only way we get the news out of the country. And one thing out of curiosity, obviously we talk a lot about independent media, but that's not the same as, for example, having an opinion or having someone who supports the war. And my question would be, would you hire someone who supports independent media but also supports the ongoing war? Or maybe do you have someone that... No, I don't, th I don't think such people <laughs> exist, to be <laughs> honest. Because a a everyone with a normal mind <laughs> is against this war, you know? So um, the answer is no, I wouldn't. I would not trust such a person. You, you have stated that uh, you want Amsterdam to become the center of Russian independent media. You're building studios to make that wait, wait, no, we, we, we have studios. Yeah, and also they new operate. ones at, at Mediavart, right? Uh, at uh, DPG, that's the headquarters of three main newspapers here mm. in, uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam. And we have uh, TV studios and big newsroom. Uh, we have uh, about... 80, 90 journalists there now, mm. um, Russian journalists. So it actually already is the biggest hub of independent journalism. Will that be your legacy? Oh, <laughs> um, my legacy. My, my legacy assumes that I'm dead. <laughs> um, and I'm not dead at all. So um, I, I, I don't think in these terms. Now, now you know, what, what worries me is that we came here two years ago uh, with the idea to return very soon. We mm -hmm. thought first, like in a couple of months, then in a year, and now it's two years, and the war is going in the completely wrong direction. And the support for Ukraine is, is uh, as you, you know, read the newspapers, uh, you, know, you can see the, it's going down. You know, America is not giving money, Europe, Europe uh, we have a government, or the biggest party mm. in the parliament, is against support of Ukraine. So, uh, you know, the urgency <clears throat> to talk about Russia and Ukraine, uh, to talk about defeating Putin, is bigger than ever. So, our work is more relevant and more important than ever. Um, uh, but it's an uphill struggle. Um, and of course, you know, uh, 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 it, it, that makes it hard, especially for my colleagues who, you know, uh, many young people who left their houses in a split second. We all left with one suitcase. Um, and 
they have family there, they have children there, and they have no idea if and when they will see them again. And that's, that's really difficult. There's a gentleman there waving his hand. Yeah. Well, we'll wrap up this interview for now, and um, if you have any questions, you may approach the podium in a moment. Um, but that said, thank you very much, Dirk, for making time for this interview, and thank you all for attending our last interview before the Christmas break. Um, coming up for you, we actually have on Wednesday a workshop about investigative journalism and OSINT journalism, how to collect intelligence, hosted by OSINT for Ukraine. So. Uh, feel free to check that up on our website or Instagram page and sign up in the link. And we hope to see you there and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And keep, keep reading, read the Moscow Times and support Ukraine. Okay. Thank you.